I spend a lot of my time thinking about artificial intelligence, but I do so wondering about what the future of humanity is in the face of this artificial intelligence. And that is somewhat ironic because when I'm not thinking about that, I also run a company which is specialized in artificial intelligence. So I thought today we might explore that inherent contradiction together and wonder what's going on and look at it through the lens of two questions. Now, the problem is the answer to the first question is not very positive. But bear with me, don't get discouraged, even if I paint a dystopian view, because the answer to the second question is much, much better. So the first question is, where are we with artificial intelligence, let's just call it AI, and what are the risks? And unfortunately, the current perception is somewhat binary and very, very negative. Humans one, or humans zero, sorry, and AI one. In fact, machines win and humans lose, but they lose everything. I think it's very important at this stage to, to, to really spell out the debate and introduce the notion that we're not talking about sentient technology. We're not talking about AI with consciousness. I know no engineer that currently works on those two topics. What we are talking about is super intelligence, at least better than what's up here. And to bring that home, if I'm playing a game of chess against a computer, which I regularly do, I will probably lose, which I regularly do, and it actually does not matter if the machine is sentient or not. The net result is I lose. And games are actually a very relevant metaphor to look at the notion and the developing notion of AI and its impact on human beings. So it starts off with Checkers, 1959, Samuel Checkers program, the first Checkers playing machine. But very rapidly, in 97, we have the deep blue chess machine beating Garry Kasparov, the reigning grandmaster in chess. Magnificent feat of engineering that it allowed that to happen. Then we have the 2011 IBM Jeopardy win by Watson, an incredible feat of natural language processing. And finally, we have the big granddaddy of them all, Go. Now, why I put all of these on the board is to talk about exponential growth in complexity. Each of these games is exponentially more complex than the one before it. So if we look at chess, it's an eight by eight board, which gives you, if you play 10 moves ahead, you have about 60,000 possibilities to calculate in your brain. If you play 20 moves ahead, you have 3.5 billion options that you have to calculate. To beat a grandmaster, you need at least 14 moves ahead. That's a huge challenge. And it lends itself very well to that brute processing power of computers. But when it comes to Go, that's infinitely more complex. It's a 19 by 19 board with 360 pieces. So 10 moves equal 10 billion possibilities. And even some of the best computers can't process that in the time that would be necessary to make the next move. So we need to do something else. And we, we need to almost mirror the brain, the notion of neural networks. How do we build a machine that can not just be fed the 30 million different possibilities from the best games ever played? Because then the machine would be as good as the human. And we were trying to build a machine that was better than the human. So rather, once we're fed at those 30 million moves, how can we train that machine to start playing itself and then to play different versions of itself and play those games millions of times every single day until it's much better than the best of all human beings? And that draws us to the notion of intelligence, which is a fascinating concept because we see over the over the last 250,000 generations since we were removed from apes. A slow linear progression, we're not bad. But in the last few decades, we've invented another form of intelligence with an exponential growth curve. 
And exponential functions are very difficult for humans to understand. They start slow, gradual. There's the disappointments, the hiccups, the patient starts to wear thin. And then Siri doesn't work. We still know that. It's very inaccurate. The Google Maps don't work very well. But rapidly, it goes into that exponential growth curve. We are here, which is a fascinating dilemma. Technology is a very, very powerful force for change, but not all of that change will be positive. So if we look at the employment market through the context of this graph, I call it the great decoupling. Since the turn of this century, investments and profits have been at record levels, but the percentage of jobs to population has actually declined for the first time ever. If you think about the first machine revolution, that was the industrial revolution. It was all about how do we build a machine that can help us overcome the limits of our muscle. When we look at this second machine age, it's about that machine and how can we enable it to escape the limits of our own mental ability. That's a whole different ballgame. There will be many consequences and we're already seeing that in the jobs market. So at this current time, 48% of the US uh, job categories are actually in critical risk areas. That's, um, that's an alarming fact. I was reading the paper this morning where, in fact, Goldman Sachs, an investment bank, and some of you might not know, might know that bank, are in fact investing their typical traders, uh, replacing their typical traders, 10 traders for one computer programmer, and that's happening currently. Like in all revolutions, there will be winners and losers, and we have to be very, very careful and think deeply about this particular revolution, because we risk creating a very small group of winners, a very large majority of losers, a permanent subclass. And that's quite alarming. It's quite alarming in a lot of areas, but we can explore and break that down into different chapters. Autonomous vehicles, we've all heard about them, the rumors, they're coming, wonderful, or is it? When you think of it, AV, autonomous vehicle technology, it is an incredible feat. You have a digital brain, and we have programmed it to drive down a street. It's an extraordinary, complex game of pattern matching in a constant shifting, changing environment. Extraordinary feat. But how do you program a machine to make morally biased or unbiased judgments. So, here comes the machine, but a cat runs across the road. Should it stop? Should it put its passenger at risk? What if 10,000 cats run across the road at that point? What should it do? What should it do differently? What if there are two passengers in the car and there's a pedestrian that steps out onto the road? What evasive action does that car take? What if the, the pedestrian is pregnant? Very, very complex to actually program that sort of moral logic into a machine. We're also writing things that we can no longer control or see. And this refers to the great flash crash of 245 on May 6, 2010. So in just five minutes, we lost $1 trillion worth of value from the stock exchange. And to this day, actually, we don't really even know why. I mean, the dominant theory is that there were two rogue algos in constant feedback loop that were destroying the market apart. But the interesting thing is, actually, we have no clue. We couldn't even find them. There are also moral dilemmas. So meet our friend Atlas. He's a 1.8 meter titanium robot, perhaps the, the first species of robo sapiens. He's designed by DARPA. And here we see him self-navigating in extremely complex uh, terrain. The cord that you see behind him is actually just a power cord. He's just doing all the rest of the work by himself. So he was designed for search and rescue. And there's a very fine line between wanting a little bit more of this and a whole lot less of that. Laws or lethal autonomous weapons systems are actually forecast to, grow, to comprise up to 30% of the US military in the next decade alone. Even now, we have 
one in every three warplanes, which is a drone. That's a robot. And the question there is, who has the final say on who pulls the trigger? But it's also a very fine line, and I don't think even Arnold Schwarzenegger would mess with this kind of bot. And this is a new kind of bot. This is called an intimate class bot. So it's a sex bot. And actually reading and researching into to, to sex bots, I found that there are already 43 on the market. And in fact, they're forecast to be commonplace by 2025. And of course, this raises a whole slew of moral arguments. So we have many future challenges that we must solve, not just jobs, not just the other factors, but a whole slew of problems that we need to solve before we've invented, before we've finished the act of inventing all of this. One of those is containment. How do we contain a superintelligence? The next is extinction. You know, Stephen Hawking, this is his number one worry, is that an artificial intelligence which surpasses our own will be the last invention that we ever make. Democracy. Shall we give robots rights? If they have rights, what about the right to recreate themselves, to procreate? If they can give birth to other AIs at a digital time scale, infinitely, and they have the right to vote, there goes democracy. Lots of complex questions. And that brings us to the second and final chapter, which is the better question, I think. How do we redefine it? and call it not race against the machine, but race with the machine. And for that, we have to go back in computer science history. The founder of the AI debate was Minsky. He believed fundamentally that we could mirror the human brain and build an alternative AI. In the other camp, there was Licklider, and he believed in something that they call intelligence augmented. It's a really complex term. So let's just call it mind-machine. The partnership of a mind-machine would be far more powerful than an AI alone or a human alone. And we can see this playing out in 2005, absolutely fascinating game of chess, uh, where you had amateur players play against a supercomputer and a grandmaster, and guess who won? Well, who came in third was the supercomputer who came in second was the supercomputer plus the grand chess master. And our winners were the weak humans with the weak machines, but a superior process for manipulating the machine. So the problem was at the interface. How do you better coach a computer to do what you want and how you want it? And this was an astonishing result. And I think at this stage it's important to question what is the notion of intelligence? Everything of value that we've ever created, our whole civilization was created through our intelligence. But we still don't know how the human brain actually creates intelligence, we just know that to some people, at least, it's there. But we do know what we're bad at. We're bad at mass computation, but that's fine, a computer is good at that. We do know what we're good at, which is unpredictable breakthroughs. Imagining something into existence with no past memory, or no past pattern, that's an astonishing feat. And so the second question, I would suggest that we answer it with a better together mind plus machine. Because there are a whole new class of problems that we have to solve today. So after Davos in Switzerland, which is the world, uh, the gathering of the business and political elite uh, globally, they realize that the, the world is in a critical period where it's facing multiple, multiple problems. Many of these problems are actually people problems. So we were faced in our own little way with a question last year, which was a company that said, we know the king of Saudi will die. We have very important business interests there. So help us understand who will be king out of all of these people and what will the result in power shift be? So we thought, well, we know humans are complex and we know groups are actually even more complex. But then, s calculating subjective positions is a magnitude of order more complex than that. 
And we can't code a machine to do this. We can't algorithmically program our way to any answer. So we accepted that challenge, foolishly or not, it turns out not, um, which was a good thing for the company. And we thought, how complex can that be? We have one king. Wow, we can guess one king. But when we started to go through it, we realized the king had 45 sons who produced 300 descendants, which resulted in 6,750 princes. That was complex. And then we had to multiply that by very complex notions of lineage, kinship, friendship, position, of who your mother was, etc. And we had to multiply that again by a very complex threat horizon for the Kingdom of Saudi, which is almost an exist existential threat across the Middle East at the moment. And so this is a perfect example of that mind-machine partnership. It's a computer identifying, ingesting, pulling in, processing, organizing, prioritizing vast amounts of data and then giving it to the human to say, go do what you're really good at, implying human le applying human level of attention and intuition on vast complex sets of data to do what we do really well. Hypothesize, deduct, make conclusions. I'm glad to say we got most of that, uh, most of that network Perfectly. So, I think there were two chapters to this talk. The first was not particularly positive. We will face very, very difficult times as human beings over the next decade. Every one of you will be affected, as I will, as everyone else will. But I think, ultimately, we should say that it's not technology which shapes our destiny is human beings. And I think that actually with a machine plus mind context, using and leveraging artificial intelligence, we can actually build transformative change into so many of the problems that we face today.